building your own products um, is not really, not really how we do it. But we're, we're all building Web3 products, though. It's very cool. This, this should be relevant. I was going to drop all the participants of this panel uh, a little bit of ease. So this is just going to make it cheaper for me. I'm not going to have to drop as much to everyone. <laughs> So the good thing is we can then use that to sort of analyze how that how it's going to affect Web three. So he starts off at sort of a very macro, right? And it's like we've got five systematic systemic adoption factors. If you've got a new innovation, then it's going to be dependent on time, which kind of a silly one, but it's fine. It's the sixties. Social systems. So like you know what other what are the government incentives in place? You know like what is the state of media? All these other things. Communication channels, like you know, how are you going to communicate about the innovation to other people, uh, and then adopters, right? So over time, um, I think the only two that sort of remain relevant to these days, you know, about like 60 years later, is really sort of what he says about adopters, how we think about who they are, and innovation itself, right? The good thing is that that's very that maps very well to us as builders because that means the innovation is kind of what you control, right? You control what you do with your what features you build, how you build it. And then the adopters, 
you don't control, but that's the market, right? So ultimately, this maps well, if you think about it just like this subset, it maps very well to other concepts like product market fit, which I'm sure we all kind of know, right? So this is really your product, and then this is kind of the market, right? So how, what, how can you think about that? So this is the adoption curve that he you know, put forward and popularized, and this has become a very, a pretty well-known framework. Right? So you kind of divide up all the possible users uh, that you might be targeting right, into five general buckets. The first you know, innovators, that's kind of really you guys. Right? We're the ones who are actually building the solutions, interested in the technology, doing the research, thinking about how these things can be done better, trial and error, etc. Right? Then we release it, and we release it to this very important se segment of people called early adopters. Right? And this applies to whoever your target you know, uh, uh, user is. Right? This could be application devs, if you're an infrastructure provider, or if you're an application developer, this could be end users. Right? But you need somebody to be an early adopter. You need to be able to find people who are willing to take that risk to try your product before it's fully mature. And so that term, early adopters, has become you know, quite popular to talk about when, when you're thinking about going from zero to one for a startup or for a product. Right? How do you get these early adopters? How do you identify? Then you move on to things like early majority, late majority, laggards, uh, etc. And because the difference between early adopters and those majority people is so big in, in, in practice that there was a concept called the chasm. Right? So there's a chasm between early adopters and majority people, the early market and the mainstream market. And there have been books written, in particular, there's a very famous one called Crossing the Chasm. It talks about what can you do uh, as a founder, as a marketer, to help a product cross that chasm. What do you need to do, right? And again, that concept has subsequently now uh, mapped very well to things like car market fit, right? You can kind of only really think about crossing the chasm uh, if you already have some sort of product market fit. Otherwise, you're just going to be wasting money. You might cross over, but then it's just not going to retain and you're going to end up losing users anyway. So. These frameworks actually, you know, over the past 50 years, you know, people have found a lot of very similar things. But actually, it kind of all comes back to a lot of the things that were, um, you know, put forward in this diffusion of innovations uh, book and theory. Okay. So uh, another curve, another graph that you might end up being familiar with as a result of this is this kind of S-shaped adoption curve, right? So as a result of that, if you think about the cumulative um, uh, adoption. Uh, based on the, 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 the distribution of the users below, right? You have a cumulative, and it ends up at this, this kind of like S curve with some very critical junctures that show you, hey, you, know, you can hard market fit, or that you're really starting to take off because you see that uh, the, the, the knee of the curve, as they call it, right? The, the adoption rate kind of goes exponential for a little bit, and then it kind of sustains. Uh, and so this is the kind of thing where, you know, again, these are just these are great ways to think about. You know, they're tools that end up you know, helping with explain, but also if you're actually a builder, it helps you think about where am I? Am I hitting this part of the curve? Am I here? Am I here? You know, and then that should that will affect the strategy that you need to use in order to get to the next stage. So, other than the adopter curve, which is sort of all of that previous stuff, he also um, you know he also sort of pioneered this kind of adoption decision process. It's now looking back, it's very simple, right? I mean, it's like, okay, knowledge, you know, back then I think mass media was sort of more of a thing. So you have to know about an innovation before you can consider, you know, whether or not you want to adopt it. Then there's sort of persuasion, and key opinion leaders, change agents, you know, all these kinds of folks are like, you know, trying to influence you. You've got decision making. So once you've kind of been exposed to it enough, you think about, am I going to adopt it or am I going to reject it? Uh, and then implementation. Right? And again, this applies to everything from businesses adopting the cloud to should I use TikTok, right? I mean, these are all similar kinds of decision processes, uh, but you know, it just kind of gave us a framework to think about. This is just something I hope know. I don't think it's you know, necessarily too applicable uh, unless you're specifically for marketing. And then the last one uh, that he talks about in a little bit of depth that I think is quite relevant still is something called innovation factors. So these are the factors that relates to the innovation itself that will help you make it easier to adopt. And this is actually quite a nice frame, and that's the one we're going to work on today, right? So he, he explains five factors, which we'll go into depth in a, in, a, in a second, but the relative advantage of your innovation, or if you want to think about it more uh, you know, 
concretely or relevant to you yourself, it's sort of the relative advantage of your product relative to other products, relative to your previous product, if you're doing iteration, relative to a previous type of technology, right? So relative advantage. Compatibility with the existing things out there, both the existing tools as well as society, you know, our behavior. Complexity. Trialability just means how easy is it for a new user to try your innovation or your product? Uh, what is the cost to them? You know, is it, what's the cost of failure if they try it, they try it, they get it, etc. Uh, and observability, so when they try it, um, do other people know, right? If they're using it, is it easy for other people to see that they're using it? Therefore, you can have this effect of being able to tell them, right? This is a great framework, I think we're gonna come back to this in just one second. Uh, so, and then the second framework I wanted to talk about is from a separate you know, research agency called Gartner. I mean, have you guys, you guys have heard of this one, Gartner Hype Cycle? This one's also very, very popular. Um, and so this, this was originally from a research firm that they actually kind of like branded and put out there. But it ended up being pretty good. Uh, you know, the original paper was written in 1995. They've done subsequent sort of updates uh, throughout the years. Um, but it really kind of like talks about like how, you know, there's an animation trigger, people are creating expectations. And the cool thing about this kind of thing now is that it really starts mapping to like, you know, we can all imagine how this maps to Web3 as a group, or like Bitcoin or like Ethereum, right? And like how, you know, it kind of spikes and it comes down. Uh, and we'll see that, uh, you know, we'll play a lot of this out as well. And so, you know, I think this was actually in one of their other papers, but I don't see this one as often, but I think it's actually quite instructive. Like you think about when does the peak peak, like when does it turn? It's because a lot of people stop joining in just because it's in, right? Like this curve, this positive hype curve, is actually driven by a lot of people who may not even know that much about the product or the under underlying innovation themselves, but they just need to be in because other people are in, right? But at some point, and without you know really going into too much detail about why it stops, but at some point, people, the number of people doing that just stops and it slows down enough that ultimately it becomes a drop off, right? But then on the other side, you get the, the opposite effect, right? And you don't want to miss out just because it's out. So it's kind of, I mean, this is all just FOMO at work, fundamentally, right? FOMO on both sides, or like, you know, fear and greed, and whatever. But uh, again, it's just a good useful framework, and since, you know, you guys are very familiar with it. So actually, you know, they related the two, again, you kind of like, you know, plop one on top of the other, for all intents and purposes, you get a similar type of thing, right? So you get this innovative, uh, you know, technology trigger, you get a peak inflated expectations as a lot of early adopters start talking about it and showing it off, and people realize that there's something there. But then there's a profit dissolution. Actually, the features are not all good enough yet. There's actually the technology is not mature enough yet. It's not actually that useful yet. But everyone had to try it just because all these early adopters, these key influencers, you know, everybody was talking about it. Right? So you have that FOMO effect. But then, as you as the product itself begins to mature, then you start moving back up that silver light and eventually good. And then the last one, so you know, I did white later back in 2011, a uh, long time ago, but this is something that you know was talked about quite often at that time from an essay uh, published in 2008. How, how many of you have seen this one, right? I mean, this is a very classic kind of startup curve. Uh, and you know, there's some great memes that came out of this, you know, it's like TechCrunch initiation. At the time, TechCrunch was pretty much the go-to publication, right? You get launched on TechCrunch, all of a sudden, you know, your servers explode, and everybody's like, you know, pinging you about, you know, like, wow, congratulations, you guys are on TechCrunch. And then the next day, nobody's talking about you because there's a new product, right? And that's a real phenomenon, right? That, that actually happens, it happened to us, it's happened to every single startup during that time. You get this amazing, like, initiation, and then, and then it goes nowhere. Then the trough of sorrow is something that everybody loves talking about. It's basically 95% of your startup journey is spent in the trough of sorrow. So it's kind of like, you kind of get used to it, and then you just like, you know, just learn to live with it, and what does that feel like? And then including things like, what is your false hope? Because like, you think it's getting better, but it's really not. Uh, and then hopefully you get more honest. Right? But this is a great, another, just another good framework to think about adoption. And, you know, why, why, why do I talk about three different, very similar uh, adoption frameworks is actually because what you'll realize is that there's very similar adoption patterns at different levels of social scale, 
right? Whether you're talking about a very macro level and like it's the entire all of society adopting whatever computers or something like that, or you go all the way down to the micro of like your next product release, you can think about it the exact same way, right? There's going to be this type of a, a, a hype cycle-ish type of a curve, this kind of like expectations that are coming down and the slow adoption, you know, all those kinds of things thinking about early adopters, all of that is, is relevant no matter what level of scale you're talking about. You could be a huge company, you could be a country even, you could be you know, a single product manager, a single developer pushing out a new release, right? And uh, it's, it's still a useful thing, right? Also, you know, what that means is that from an industry category product, you think about it sort of like Web3, then you've got like a product category like wallets, and then it could be like you know, Toby Wallet, you know, our product specifically. Right, so it's the same kind of a mapping. And then it's also very interesting to sort of think about it as it's very similar even at different time scales. Right? If you look at the price of Bitcoin all time up until so called like a few months ago, right? It looks remarkably similar to like it did from the period in like 2014 to 2016. And it looks again remarkably similar to a random week that I pulled out in the Bitcoin chart, like, you know, two months ago. Right? This kind of um, idea, again, is that you can kind of use that anytime you want. The result is that history ends up repeating itself. This is AI. AI is in, in the 80s with expert systems or deep learning in the, you know, like, uh, the knots and the, the teens in the 2000s, and then recently it's Gen AI. It's the same kind of thing. It's going to repeat itself over and over. And what it also means is that history copies itself. It means that not only within a single industry, but you're going to see the same thing happening uh, with Web3 that you did with Cloud, as you did with VRAR, as you did with AI. Right? And if anything, Web3 is actually the most recent of uh, If you kind of actually think about it, AI has actually been around much longer than Web3. So, you know, then we get a, we're going to get next into like, where are we in you know, Web3 on this adoption curve. But, uh, you know, I would, I would argue that we're way earlier on, on Web3 than uh, you know, folks are in AI. So yeah, that's, I mean, if you guys are familiar, I mean, these, it's like fractals everywhere, right? I mean, it, it, you know, yeah, so applied examples. All right, let's move into some kind of meaty stuff here. So the question, you know, that we are supposed is sort of like, where is Web3? Because that, that helps you, like I said, sort of think about what kind of strategies that you want to kind of, kind of employ. Um, you know, I would argue that there's a little bit of a difference. I think Web3 uh, does two things really well, and I'll talk about that in a second when we get to relative relative advantage, but it's actually infrastructure and it's also uh, digital assets, right? So Web3 as a digital asset, I would say that we're actually starting to move into the early majority of this point. I think one of the things, and we'll talk about it in a second, like Web3 has been very good at to help adoption is because digital assets in Web3 land fit very, very well. They're very compatible with digital assets in and we'll talk about that in a second. Like Bitcoin, I mean, Bitcoin, getting an ETF is a, is a is definitively a majority. That's not like, that's not really a right? I mean, the ability to buy a Bitcoin ETF is definitively a really majority, right? On the other hand, using Web3 to um, create, you know, a social fine app, that's way, we're like, you know, we're still, I think we've only had one hype cycle maybe in like a small, like maybe friend tech has gotten this, maybe a little bit of a tiny bump, right? But like we're still sort of in the innovator, innovator kind of stage for something like social fine. And you can talk about the same thing for like DeFi, GameFi, you know, you know, et cetera, all these kinds of different ways, you can kind of break it down. But so, you know, Web3 is not monolithic either, but some parts of it are moving into the majority at this point very rapidly, and some parts are still early in the innovator. Why is that? Right. So let's, let's take a look, right? So, okay, here's the framework. And this is what we're going to work through in a second as well, if you guys are interested, right? Relative advantage. It answers this question. In what way is Web3 a better mousetrap? You guys have kind of heard, heard that, right? Sorry. Like, what kind of features and performance do you get out of Web3 that you don't from its comparative, you know, its, its alternative, Web2? Then you have compatibility. How well does Web3 fit to existing values patterns of behavior or tools, right? So that's not just in front of tools, even though it's mentioned, but also society. Like are the habits that you're going to be uh, bringing to the table when you interact with things in Web3, similar to the habits that you had when you were interacting with things in Web2, right? 
Quest, how easy is it to learn to use Web3? Trialability, how low is the cost of trying Web3? And observability, are Web3 benefits noticed? If someone's using Web3, can others see it being used? All right, so uh, I'm gonna give you kind of, you know, this is just my quote unquote answers to these questions, um, but uh, relative advantage, I, I personally think compared to Web2, uh, and there's, again, two things, right? So there's infra and then there's digital and then assets. And then you compare it to web two and you compare it to digital assets. The advantages are, are clear, right? So you've got some permission stuff, um, you've got composable stuff, you've got digital permanence, you've got digital ownership, uh, and it really brings down the cost of creating digital assets. These are like fundamental comparative advantages of web three versus web two. Right? That's actually, if you think about the whole drive of the innovation of web three, it's these kinds of principles that are pushing everything else, right? Like why is a social fi app going to be better than a social web 2? Why is a game in Web3 going to be better than a game in Web2? Why is a digital asset or a financial asset in Web3 going to be better than a financial asset in Web2? It's because of these underlying structural properties of Web3 that make it different from Web2, right? But it also comes with structural disadvantages, right? So as we know, the cost of interaction and storage is much, much higher as well as the lack of flexibility in terms of upgrading and scaling, right? So these things, you know, it's a Faustian bargain, right? It's like, it's, it's, it's a trade-off that, that we made and said, okay, well, in exchange for all of those things, uh, you know, we're, we're willing to take some of these disadvantages. And we'll talk about what the concrete impact of that is in a second. So the compatibility, though, I think it's very, I think it's very interesting. This, this bifurcates very, very starkly between infrastructure and the assets that are created on top of it. The infrastructure itself, I would argue that compatibility is incredibly low. Like it's, you think about how easy is it, right, to switch from a Web2 stack to a Web3 stack in terms of like going all the way down to like your servers and like your data storage, it's incredibly low, right? It, it's not only just difficult from like a technology perspective, but also the trade-offs that you have to currently make from things like privacy and control perspectives are almost, I mean, it's, it's you know, breaking Web3 in a lot. Right? It's like without solving things like privacy, for example, we're never actually going to move beyond, uh, we're never going to overtake Web2 as an infrastructure provider for the internet. And I think that's something, you know, I mean, Vitalik has talked about it as well. This is just something that's very core and a, and a, and a deep challenge. Well. And on top of that, it's incredibly complex. So, in order to adopt Web3 as an individual, every single one of us had to go through crazy journey of understanding how blockchains work to some extent, but definitely how seed phrases work, how signatures work, how gas works, how chains work. Like all of that is knowledge that sure we now have and we can do it and we feel like experts, but like imagine every single new person trying to do that. Every single person in this room is clearly still an innovator or an early adopter, right? Except when you think about the currency side, right? When you think about the currency side, the compatibility and complexity is so clear, right? Compatibility-wise, you can trade a meme coin the same way that you trade a stock. No difference, right? Because the things you talk about are who's going to buy off me? Are these prices going up or down? The number of things you have to think about are exactly the same, right? So when you think about, you know, now with BT, uh, you know, like BTC ETFs, you know, taking off, lowering the complexity for people to get involved with that, that adoption is going to be huge, right? Because now you don't have to even like, get a Bitcoin wallet, you know, and hopefully if the ETFs end up coming through, and the SEC doesn't you know, crush us, you know, that, uh, you know, that's going to that's gonna help with ETFs. Uh, right? So that kind of stuff is like, it's such a different world. For infrastructure, compatibility and complexity is so terrible. Right now, with at least assets, so on the financial asset side of things, it's getting much, much better. Right? And a lot of that is really because it's so compatible with the existing financial system. Right? You can wrap it into an ETF. How would you do that with an NFT? It just doesn't, like, who's going to make an ETF out of, I don't know, graves or like putting that right? It's just not, it's not there. Trialability and observability. Trialability uh, has been also just terrible in Web3, right? So this is also like if you're looking for problems to solve in Web3, like there's a litany of problems to solve, right? Trialability is so bad. Mistakes are often permanent, they're costly, there's a huge and steep learning curve. The moment that you get scammed, you lose everything, right? You make a bad transaction and you buy something, you're stuck, right? You deploy a contract and it was incorrect, it's getting hacked. You know, like there's all these things where like trialability of Web3 is extremely costly, right? It's it's making mistakes in Web3 is very costly because of the cost related to actually doing 
doing things, and then also the fact that it touches our money. And so as a result, uh, and it's also incredibly complex, and it's open, and it's, there's just all these structural things that make child building very, 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 very bad, right? And this can be improved. Observability. Also, I think here is that for infrared tools, fundamentally, observability is very different, right? It's like, how do I know that I'm using AWS versus Google, Google, you know, Google Cloud, for example, right? Like, that's not even something that's easy on the web two side of things, right? Now we're trying to tell people, it's like, oh yeah, it's like, at some point I'm gonna advertise Google that I'm using web three infrastructure instead of web two infrastructure, that's, that's quite tough. Again, at least on the currency and asset side, it's somewhat more observable because you're gonna flex, right? You're gonna flex about the money that you made, maybe you're rocking an NFT instead of, you know, like a PFP on, on Twitter or something like that. A little bit more on the asset side, but the infra side, how could we kind of improve that? So that's where the, you flip it, right? So then you go, okay, from the strategy side, you assess it, and you look at what the current situation is. Then it becomes solutions. How might we? increase Web3 option. So if you guys are sort of product people or designers, maybe the framework of like how might we you're familiar with, like HMWs, right? To flip a problem on its head, you just go, okay, well, how might we? Right? So how might we increase Web3's relative advantage? How might we make Web3 more compatible? How might we make it easier to learn? How might we lower the cost of trying it? How might we make Web3 benefits more noticeable? These are all things that will help Web3 uh, you know, get better adoption. This is just, again, just a super short list that I put together of like, some things that I've seen, some ideas, etc. Right? So obviously, we all know we're trying to scale blockchain infrastructure. Right? We do know this, including on ETH and BTC. BTC L2s are coming as well, and Kuhn, etc. You know, higher TPS, lower gas, proof of stake versus proof of work, etc. Et There's tons of really great, brilliant people who are trying to uh, you know, innovate our way out of the structural disadvantages that Web3 has relative to Web2. But there's still a lot to do there, right? Compatibility, I think one of the big things that we can do is you know, using Web3 interfaces on existing user interfaces versus new ones. So this is something that's you know, close to our heart as well. You have to do it, like as a new user trying to get into Web3, you have to change all your behaviors, right? How many people had, in, had installed a, a Chrome browser plugin wallet before Web3? Absolutely zero. There was no, Venmo did not have a Chrome plugin, right? Like PayPal did not have like a Chrome plugin. Like nobody, nobody installs Chrome plugins in order to use money in their bank. Like that's just not, that's just not how it works, right? So how you're telling somebody that you have to do it completely different. Well, now thankfully we're seeing a lot more progress in that direction at least, right? So I mean, mobile, the native mobile apps were already a good start. I mean. Uh, and then now we're starting to think about, you know, for us, we're putting a wallet inside the Telegram so that you can just access it because you're already using Telegram. Maybe you can just use the wallet in there as well, right? But like, you know, you think about sort of, you know, the compatibility side of things, that's really tough. Another one is like, can we make it easy to migrate from Web2 architecture to Web3 architecture? Like that would be a huge thing. I know that there are folks who are working on that, sort of like Terraform-ish type of, um, uh, you know, projects to make it just really easy to, to abstract away the underlying and then so kind of port images, but still a long way to go there. And the other one that I think is just a really killer is if we can solve the privacy issue, and, and I know that a lot of people are enthusiastic about ZK on this as, as a solution, uh, there's just tons of research going on there. Hey, who here, is anyone working on privacy? Okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. I think right now, privacy is just absolutely huge. We, like, everybody in the web too is still used to having privacy. Right? You do something and it isn't literally on chain so that everybody in the world can look it up anytime they want. That behavior change is so incompatible with the existing world that it's, I mean, yeah, it's, it's holding tons and tons of people back from using Web3. Even, even, even people who know and understand who've gotten over complexity and trialability and observability and already like, I get it, but like, I just don't want people to know that I have X amount of money in this wallet. You're just like, okay, how do we get around that? So privacy is just repetitive, it's just absolutely not. Um, then complexity, okay. How can we abstract away things that target adopters don't need to know? Whether that's the app uh, devs or end users, how do we abstract away gas, how do we abstract away chains, how do we abstract away recovery phrases? Like these are all kind of wallet related because that's that's my domain, but I'm sure there's tons of these in like game fly, social fly, like how do you just abstract away the things like you know, again. Maybe data ownership, you don't have to think about where your data is stored. It just feels like it's like what to, except that you just own it somewhere and you can access it when you want. Just think of things like that. Right? 
trial ability. So trial ability, I think, is actually a really interesting one in Web3 because there's been so much innovation.